uh, dealings with very young people as well. And really what we, talk, we were um, proposing is that we take our um, <coughs> clinics down from seven clinics to um, five clinics, but we lose a lot of capacity within our clinics, and we increase the, um, the hours that are open, which are around 84 hours a week that we have of clinic provision, um, but just in an alternative venue. Um, the rationale for um, those two changes is that um, clinic provision is all contained in the paper, uh, but essentially there are a number of um, quality issues um, in terms of the service we can offer from those two venues due to the limitations of the estate um, themselves um, and also they're um, quite low performing in terms of the activity um, that comes through each of those clinics. We've also had part of the proposal done some engagement work with the clients who are currently using um, those two clinics and what we found is that the majority of those clients are using the, um, those particular clinics because of the um, time of day and day of the week that the clinics run rather than their particular location. Um, so we feel that we can, we can deliver um, a more efficient service from our five sites which are better equipped to deliver um, a quality service um, than from uh, seven sites with two sites that, that, that limit us really in terms of that service offer um, and the quality of the service that we're offering. We'd be looking to potentially um, interchange within around day four with a very comprehensive engagement um, strategy in the first thing that really looks that time and um, so that all of our patients and our clients were, were engaged with around any potential moves um, and um, we've got you know sort of um, links with the local press, Facebook sites, Twitter, all of those ways to try and connect with, with, um, with, with our patients and the clients that come to our service. It's not a 
have a very robust understanding of how urgent care works across the world and the improvements that we can make to ensure that um, each part of the system is working as effectively as it possibly can. And that is managed through an urgent care network that meets on a very, very regular basis to oversee all of the different initiatives that are taking place across the health and social care community. However, as we would have seen in the news, particularly over the Christmas and New Year period, urgent, the urgent care system across the country remains under a very significant amount of pressure. Um, but it, but uh, I'm actually pleased to say, despite uh, that pressure across the country, and just even though the, um, the Wirral uh, did not deliver on the 95% target for quarter three, our, input, our performance at 92% for the quarter was still remarkably good given some of those pressures. <clears throat> Again, the priority here is to ensure that we deliver safe and high quality care, uh, working in partnership across uh, all the different agencies. And there are obviously a range of initiatives underway, both to educate and advise people on uh, the best use of urgent care but also to ensure where possible we can manage uh, people's conditions out in the community and away from the need to attend mm -hmm. the acute hospital. This effort continues and is ongoing, but is a significant challenge. So those are the summary of the papers that you have before for you. Very, very broad and challenging agendas, but ones in which we're working very hard to, to across the system uh, and together into, with partners to address how to take it through. Yes, I'm down. Thank you. Neither of the three. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just actually what I wanted to ask about was really, uh, was just perhaps to help me, but to then to understand the. Um, the overall financial position. And um, the figures, the numbers we've got out here for October and not back to November. Um, one of us, there were a, a couple of things which I, I, I didn't fully understand. The, the, you must get quite considerable variations month by month because you were actually budgeting for a surplus in, in October. And it, it, that seems strange. You think in a hospital setting it would be maybe in the winter months it goes up, it, maybe that is up to, or maybe it's more profitable in the winter. I don't know. Because that was interesting to know why you get that variation. The other point is you've got a cost improvement plan, which is, um, if I'm reading it correctly, is designed to save. As far as the budget was concerned, at least 13 million pounds. The previous year, you had a, a, a deficit. I don't know what the final figure was, but I assume in 2014 you had a deficit maybe of about 5 million. So in this year's budget, am I right in thinking that even after allowing the you had a deficit the previous year of 5 million? You've got a cost improvement plan of 13 million, but you still then plan, even after absorbing that 13 million, for a deficit in the current year, 1415. Um, that seems quite. It, the cost improvement plan is a big number, and the fact that it didn't seem to make any impression on the overall deficit compared to the previous year seemed. <coughs> strange to me. And, and just uh, one final point was, <clears throat> is the, ultimately, is our park supposed to operate at break even? What is the, how long can you run the deficit? Um, is, it the, is it the value of the, the EBITDA number that we could look at, or is it that final surplus deficit that is the, actually the, the significant yeah. number? So we might take each of those in turn. Um, in terms of the variation in the year, um, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that there is a degree of variation in the year, and it isn't necessarily always related to the number of patients that come through the door. Often it's related to 
Uh, for example, we receive quite a lot of education money that comes through the deanery for the education of junior doctors, and that doesn't come in a smooth way through the year. So, so uh, there will be examples of, 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 of different uh, receipts of income that change through the year. But um, it, 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 the board are very clear when they sign off the budgets uh, for the year where the month, where the annual tra tra trajectory is, is supposed to fall, so that they can monitor that performance on a monthly basis. As you can see, as you can see in this uh, monthly report, the board was it was expecting the uh, trust to make a surplus um, in month, uh, and in fact, in this month, it did make a surplus. Um, so that, 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 that annual trajectory is very clear and transparent to the board on these services. But in answer to your core question, it isn't a, there isn't a direct correlation between um, the number of patients that come through the debt through, through the door in the financial position. There are other factors that play. Secondly, in terms of the relationship between the 13, 14 <coughs> unplanned deficit position and the 14, 15 planned deficit position, um, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, that the, 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 the trust, the NHS, remains under a, a, a huge degree of uh, financial pressure related. So the trust, for example, will see the tariff, so the amount that it receives for the service it, services it delivers, reduce um, on an annual basis. And subject to negotiations with uh, commissioners, will need to agree actually how um, it can manage the reduction in that tariff to protect the delivery of frontline services. So the overall, if you like, pot of money available to the trust that it receives through tariff income will be reducing year on year. Uh, and of course, it, it has to balance that with the fact that it needs to continue to deliver that core of uh, required services and that its costs will be increasing. I think the difference between 13, 14, and 14, 15 is that the 13 14 position was an unplanned deficit. So it, 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 uh, it, the, the board hadn't agreed to that level of, of, of deficit. Whereas 14 15, what the trust has said in, in, in partnership with its uh, commissioners is that its position is to plan for a deficit to enable it to start to make some of the changes it needs in its infrastructure uh, to allow it to move from a position where it's delivering. Um, the quantum of services that it's delivering at the moment to perhaps delivering services in a different way going forward. But you're, it's very true to say that that is not a sustainable position in the long term. And the key metric basically is the amount of cash that the organisation has in the bank. Now I'm pleased to say we've done quite a lot of work this year on how we manage cash. Uh, our cash position is a lot healthier than uh, we predicted it to be because of a number of changes we've made to the way we manage cash. Uh, so the, the trust has roughly 15 million pounds worth of cash in the bank at the moment, uh, but obviously that will only last for a certain amount of time before the, the, the organisation runs out of money. Um, now, monitor and regulator look at that on a regular and monthly basis to both look at the amount of cash we have in the bank, but also our current run rate, our IME position, uh, and obviously as part of our financial plan for next year and the year after. We're not looking at that ourselves, we're also talking to the commissioners about what does that mean for uh, their aspiration to deliver a uh, comprehensive set of DGH based services for the population of the world. So it's a very challenging, I accept, um, complex position. So we'll Given the constraints under which you're working, I, I, I do have to record the 92.24% that's been achieved uh, against the 95% standard. However, what you've just said with regards to you know, if the level of funding remains over the next few years, and um, I'm just wondering, firstly, I, would, if you, I know it's, there's many variables with regards to what causes A&E to not meet its targets. We don't know there's many reasons why 
but it is distressing to see that this is replicated up and down the country. So if you could give me a few kind of bullet points as to you know, what, what it is that's led to this and, and what, what's in store for Arapan a and &E in the future if, if, continue, if the funding continues to, to well, yeah, for that to be the funding continues to be less than what it requires in order to operate. Um, I, I think the board are very clear that uh, given the uh, demographics and given the epidemiology of the population in the world, then it's absolutely crucial that we maintain the delivery of a 24-7 A&E. Um, and indeed, over the past um, 12 months at least, we've made very significant investments in terms of increasing the number of nursing staff in the department, increasing number of um, medical staff in the department because frankly it's really important that we continue to deliver a really high quality service um, but of course that's against the background of a very those investments have been against the background of a very <coughs> challenging financial position for the trust um, so uh, and of course you will have seen from a capital, <coughs> from a capital perspective and hopefully haven't had to go to A&E recently, but if you had had to go to A&E recently, you would have seen that the Trust has, that this year and last year, invested significant capital into the department to improve its infrastructure and to make it a more uh, appropriate environment in which to treat patients. But clearly, and one of the challenges that we face as a health community is that um, we need to have a, and I think we have, a, a, a strategy for urgent care that encourages and directs people to use urgent care facilities in the, in the best possible location for them. Um, and I think we've all got a collective responsibility to be majoring on that information, giving to our populations that they are using the best possible facility for urgent care across the range of options that are available to them. Uh, but, but I, I think I'm pleased to say that through the urgent care, care network and the relationships <coughs> that we have with commissioners and the other partners, we are working hard and well on that. And in fact, the NE target is a, it's not just a trust target, it's a health community target. So, so all of the organisations in the health community are, are assessed against that. So I think in summary what I'd say is we've made some investments to improve, which demonstrates our commitment to delivering a high quality service, notwithstanding the wider financial position. And we have, I think, a cohesive health community, health and social care community approach to making sure that we do that as much as we possibly can uh, across all of the range of different uh, areas of provision to uh, deliver this in the best possible way. But it remains very challenging. Yeah, I was just going to say, of um, some pay spend uh, because there is no um, analysis of staff infrastructure and I know that there has been some recently downgrading mm -hmm. staff including theatre staff. Um, but that's still subject to consultation that's being worked through with the, with the staff side department. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I'll go with the consultation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Subject to an, 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 uh, the usual HR process. Um, how, so far, in my mind, um, how's the staff set lives 
um, or is it staffing pressures? Is it collection things? When, when did it start? When did it come back to the yeah. Okay, so um, to be clear, the board signed off, signs off its plan in um, April, so it signed off its plan in April 2014, and in its plan, it said that it was planning to, for, the, for the trust to make a deficit for this year of £4.2 million. Pounds. So this is a, a planned deficit. So we, we, we knew it was going to happen and we uh, had, had planned for it as part of the process that we went through at the early part of the year to agree our income and to get a good understanding of our expenditure. Well, unless I've misunderstood, your point sounds like so yes, at the point of this report, we were off plan, yes. So, what measures you're putting in place aren't working as well as you hope? So I think that the whole of the NHS is experiencing um, some difficult financial circumstances. Uh, but in fact, uh, and there are a number of NHS organisations that planned to make a surplus this year, uh, but indeed are now reporting deficits. So I, I guess what I would say is yes, we are we are off plan, but that's in the context of um, a very challenging national, regional uh, NHS position where um, I mean you will have seen in the news only over Christmas and the New Year the, number, the amounts of demands being placed on the, the, <coughs> the service are perhaps unprecedented. That's very unfortunate. We discriminate the national and the local one. You point this out in all three plans, so you know, what you're doing isn't working to some extent. But I've, I've got some questions anyway. Where possible necessary expenditure should be delayed? What exactly does that mean? So that means we don't have to spend money this year. So, for example, if we were planning to refurbish a non clinical area, then we wouldn't do that this year. But necessary expenditure. My understanding, I look, I, I'm, I'm just baffled. Necessary spending would be things that you think necessary, surely. So, so I think what, what, what it's trying to say is if, you don't, if we don't need to spend the money this year to protect high quality clinical services, which remains our priority, then we would, if possible, and, agree, and by agreement with the clinical teams, not spend that money. Okay, so one question. You mentioned an increase in staffing. Um, what percentage of that staffing is local? So like all NHS organisations, we spend money on temporary staffing, and that's to ensure that we can, where we aren't able to recruit permanent staff, that we're still able to safely um, deploy uh, services to protect patient services. So I don't have the exact numbers here, but we, we, we have a, uh, a bank, uh, which is uh, basically, we run it ourselves, that helps uh, permanently employed staff do additional hours. Um, we use that where absolutely possible to fill uh, temporary uh, rotors. Uh, our use of, temp of agency nursing is very low. Uh, we do on occasion have to use agency medical staff, and that tends to be in areas where it's difficult to recruit to senior doctors. Okay, my, my final question, sorry, was regarding um, the AMU statistics again, I suppose. You don't mention anything about the ambulance service here. How's that, how's that there above the box? So, we don't run ambulance services. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question on the ambulance service. If you want to just take them. Yeah, if you don't mind, because I'm going to just look at the four hours. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for extending the invitation to, me, to attend the Quality and Safety Committee. And I did find it extremely interesting when I saw the depth that you go into. Um, the performance measurements. Um, however, one thing that did come up there was that for the experience that somebody mother had had through the uh, experience with AE, ambulance, first of all, trying to be managed at home, then through the waiting room corridor, and then into AE. Yeah. Um, and I myself have had a lot of representation made to me about, I'm oh, so sorry, a lot of representation made to me about people waiting in ambulance for a protracted period yeah. of time. Um, first, First of all, I'm going to ask if the committee will receive a report at the next meeting on what's happening with the ambulance service and how they're responding to the pressures in, in university teaching hospital and A&E &E there. So how they're responding to that. So that's something that's come out of this. Um, but also, can you tell me um, a little bit more about the system resilience group? I've had it, I've heard it mentioned, I'm not quite sure what it does. Do you, could you tell me a bit more about that? 
kind of influence that? Yeah, so that's, that's a group of uh, senior leaders across all the health and social care organisations that come together on a very regular basis to look at what's going on around urgent care. So that obviously includes social care, that will include the community trust, it include representatives of GPs, it include lots of the hospital, it includes some clinicians. And what they do is they have a look at what's going on in the system. What are all the metrics that we use to measure the system, so A and E performance, access to GPs, etc. And, and how can we um, both um, understand what's currently going on, but also plan um, in both the short term, but also in the medium term, to ensure that we're learning, that we're making improvements, that we're um, uh, improving systems where we possibly can. Is anybody else wants to ask a question? Yes. Yeah, yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really a question of, um, of that type I understand what something means in your field. Um, in efficiency measures, you talk of cancelled operations and cancelled outpatients appointments. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to work out how that is related to efficiency. So, um, the, way, the reason that we look at it is obviously <coughs> it's an important metric of patient experience, but also, uh, if we're doing something in the trust to make better use of our money and that leads to more operations being cancelled then obviously that's not a good thing. So we, we monitor both uh, cancelling of operation and cancelled outpatient appointments because the, the, the smaller that number can be the better or if we see increases in that number then we know that something is happening and it may be related to where we might be trying to save money in a different area that is having an adverse effect on that metric. Outpatients is a particularly high figure, isn't it? It is, and, uh, although I, I, I guess I beg you to see that in the context of the fact that the trust sees something like half a million outpatients. So, yes. Thank you, John. Um, just, just finally, the financial situation we know is, I just wonder if you get a regular update on I think we do have the recommendations, so that we get, if you would be so kind as to provide a particular um, an update on what we progress. So we publish, we, we publish a finance report every month as part of our board papers. We're happy to come back. Well, not necessarily. Will you submit the report to the committee for us to not to okay. That's very much. And again, the offer's uh, extended to you too. But the committee needs no fee report. And that's for the um, report on the ambulance service and other quarterly reports. And the quarterly reports from the committee on the um, you're very welcome to say if you want to, but don't feel that. The next item on the agenda um, relates to the joint scrutiny that was handed out um, over proposed changes to the Michigan Service of Psychiatry and Cancer Centre in Rio, basically called Royal. And it's a joint report by Pastor Cummins and myself. Um, I'll introduce it briefly and then I'll ask you to make um, there have been some changes in the way local authorities can scrutinise um, matters of change of service which relate to several authorities and new scrutiny arrangements make provision for a joint scrutiny. <coughs> um, the changes that were proposed for Cashbridge Cancer Centre uh, to relocate to Liverpool Royal, its inpatient facility at uh, Liverpool Royal, uh, is one of those that um, we um, made a decision at this committee that it did uh, present a significant change in the delivery of service for us. And some local authorities in the Merseyside area um, made the same decision. So we came together as a joint committee um, to look at the uh, proposals. The, um, we met five times over a six week period and we went to several locations, including Patrick and we met with a wide range of state, stakeholders. Um, the committee was chaired by Councillor for Liverpool and it was supported by the Liverpool members' uh, support team. Um, overall, from a world perspective, we recognise that the recently improved uh, clinical effectiveness it was the right move as it would provide better care for those uh, needing acute treatment um, because it could be delivered on the same site, which isn't currently the case. Um, in the enhanced research and development, um, which would offer being located next to the university, that would lead to an improvement, continuing improvement um, in uh, treatment for cancer sufferers, which is also um, obviously a good thing. Um, and better facilities also for adolescents with cancer in a new treatment unit that's going to be built there. Um, from our perspective on Wirral, we looked particularly at what would happen to rural residents and the delivery of their service. Um, we were reassured that the 
vast majority, I think, at the region of women, well, obviously, women are women, 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 women,